After getting kicked out by his homophobic father, Adrian moved in with his boyfriend, Marcus, but when they go to a school lock-in with their possessed peers, it seems like they might have to fight to survive. Even after Will came out to his parents and friends as bisexual, he still feels like he might not fully be out. So after a fight with his color guard co-captain and the help of a cute boy and his color guard coach, he might finally get that chance. Robbie wants to come out as bisexual and stay in love with his girlfriend, but as the world presses down on him, he thinks that that might not be possible. Az is asexual, but that doesn't stop the witches who captured her and the other students from carrying out their plans and lessons. The world, along with their family, doesn't want Fisher to live their truth, and they soon find out that other things, such as the inanimate objects that start terrorizing them, might also share the same feelings. When Luck's relationship with Roe is thrust into the new spotlight, his sexuality and ability to fight crime as a superhero comes into question. Finn wants to come out and be public with his boyfriend Tylen, but when a threatening message appears in his locker, it seems like someone else may not want them to. Ava has found that kids at school don't understand her being trans, which led to her running in the woods, climbing into a tree trunk, and finding herself in a fairy realm, one that might be a bit more dangerous than high school. After nuclear bombs destroyed most of the world, camps were built to change the minds of kids like Ami, who didn't want to help in the repopulation of Earth. Colin wanted to get the perfect coming out story, and we found a way to travel back in time, which might have involved falling off of a building. He might be able to reach his goal, if only the consequences don't catch up with him. My name's Cody Tig, and those 10 premises that I just talked about were are the 10 premises from my collection of fictional coming out stories entitled The Depth of the Closet. This thesis project is a combination of 11 stories counting the prologue story that aim to add and explore um, accurate representation of various LGBTQ plus identities to popular literature. And the major focus is to show that coming out experiences are very nuanced and they're different for people depending on their situation and just who they are and also their identity and so in order to show that further other than just exploring various identities within the stories each story is also in its own genre whether that's horror psychological suspense fantasy fantasy horror romance all of that um, combines to help show that there are varieties within coming out stories and it's not all just one thing for everyone in the community. And so today I'm going to talk further about this project, specifically the origin, the process, the future of the project, and then I'm going to read an excerpt from one of the stories. So to talk to start, the origin of this process of this project is kind of interesting. Um, so I got the idea when I was in the shower on vacation during um, the summer of 2020, so that first pandemic summer, and I just saw images of these two boys running down a hallway as their possessed peers tried to murder them. And then I had images from of this girl, at the time it was um, just a girl, but now in the story it's a trans girl who went into this tree trunk and found herself in a fairy realm. And these were just like very vibrant images in my head as I was taking the shower and like thinking about these and as I was writing them down for 15 minutes after I um, ended up getting out of the shower. And I was like, these are something. And then so I ended up deciding that they were a collection of short stories and I came up with the other ideas um, as time went on. And I scrapped my other thesis idea and ended up choosing this as my thesis. And I think also when thinking about this project and just my writing in general, it's important to talk about um, uh, who I've been influenced and inspired by. So clearly I've been inspired by um, other LGBTQ plus literature. I've read especially authors like Cassandra Clare and Rick Riordan and Angie Thomas, and especially Adam Silvera, who I think has shown me that it's okay to write in different genres the way he does in um, throughout his books. Um, like switching genres, which I think has like led to the culmination of this entire project, which shows the use of various genres all in one project. And so once I got the origin of this collection and the idea, I began the process of actually writing it and completing it. And so that started um, in the fall of 2020 when I was in my Oxford tutorial class. And I began research based or about different LGBTQ plus identities, but also um, genres with like fiction genres and literature fiction, literary fiction. And then that semester, I also came up with the story ideas that I then sent to my thesis advisor, Dr. Vanderslice. 
And then in the spring of 2021, I began interviews that I wanted to conduct in order to help the accurate representation within this project since these, um, not all of these stories reflect lived experiences that I've gone through um, based on my identity. And I wanted to do these interviews in order to like make sure that representation is as accurate as possible um, and to help me just further understand these other identities. And so I asked questions such as like, how do you identify? What's an imperative? What is imperative to understand about this identity? And also like what that person's specific coming out story looked like. And I interviewed about six people for this whole project. Um, people who are identified as gay, lesbian, queer, non-binary, demigirl, and pansexual. And I think um, I did have a good variety of people I interviewed. I think it could have been further, but it was difficult to get people to um, interview and people I knew that I could interview. And also, this was the first time that I ever tried to implement research within a creative writing piece, because um, I normally just write, and like that's just the story that comes from my head. But I knew it was important to have research in this um, specific project. And so implementing that was difficult for me because I didn't know, I haven't ever done that process before. So I think those are two things that could have been expanded upon and done better. Um, but I do think that the interviews helped me, um, especially as I kept them in mind while I was writing the stories and like using feedback that I got from the interviewees, um, along with one of them later becoming a sensitivity reader for one of the stories. And so that semester, I also wrote the prologue story and the horror story. And then going into the summer of 2021, I finished nine other stories for the collection, which helped. I ended up wrapping the last one the first week of the fall semester in 2021. And that completed the collection with 11 stories. And then so in the fall of 2021 to this current spring of 2022, I've completed second and third drafts of all of the thesis stories and I'm currently working on edits. And as of now, the thesis is at 452 double spaced pages and about 135,000 words, which is quite a bit. And these stories int were intended to be short stories, but some of them have developed into novellas. Um, but I think all of them are the length that they need to be in order to tell the stories uh, effectively for this collection. And so once it's finished, obviously the part of the future is um, completing the edits for the project. And then from there um, is a possibility of querying it for publishing. I remember, I think it was the second email that I received from my thesis advisor, Dr. John Vandersize. He said, this is such an original idea, I think it could be published. And at first I was like, whoa, hang on, like, huh? Because I never thought about that. My goal was just to write a creative thesis that I would have fun doing um, and enjoy other than, opposed to like a regular research paper. And so it shocked me the idea of like being able to publish this because I hadn't even thought about that. And then it kind of, that planted a seed in my head, um, so to speak. And from there, I've gotten feedback from him and my second reader, Cindy Leah, and also from other people who have read a few of the stories. And from their feedback, I'm confident that I am working to accurately represent these um, various identities. And I think it is effective. And so I think that was my number one goal is making sure that I wasn't harming anyone because of misrepresentation. And so since I am more confident that I am planning on querying it for publishing. And so now I wanted to read about the first seven pages of one of the stories, the fantasy story, which is entitled, entitled The Realm of Truth. I used to picture images of trees rushing past me as if I was running. Each tree would turn into a blur of brown bark as I whisked past it. The foliage would join the trees in their states of blurriness while bringing dots of green to the dark brown of the forest floor. But in my imagination, I was always running to something to freedom, to happiness, to a breath of fresh air. Never had I imagined the wind rushing through my short, thin red hair as I sprinted through the giant, thick trees and higher forest away from a monstrous horde of teenagers. Well, monstrous was a stretch, but that was how I saw all the kids at my high school, and their actions never did much to take that image away. They always made, me, made fun of me for being the boy in high school who claimed to be a girl, for wanting to wear feminine clothes, for not wanting to be called Simon, I tried to get them to call me Avalyn or even Ava, but they never listened. 
All they did was throw papers at me with crude drawings, write terrible things on the whiteboard, and start horrifying chants about me being Frankenstein's daughter. Here comes Frankenthing, here comes Frankenthing, here comes Frankenthing. The chants beat with my heart as my red boots slammed against the soft dirt beneath me. I had come to school with blue skinny jeans and a red blouse today. I thought it looked good when I saw my body reflected in the mirror. Granted, I was too skinny, too small in the chest, and still looked more like a stereotypical boy in the face than I wished, but I worked with what I had. My hair took its sweet time to grow, which didn't help matters any. There were whispers and weird looks that I noticed throughout the day, and all my fears were answered when I walked down the steps of the high school and saw the crowd of 11 boys waiting. Without hesitating, I found my way back up the steps, through the doors, down the narrow hallways, and out the back doors that led to the forest behind the gym. The group of boys hollered and chased after me the whole way. Gregory isn't here to save you today, freak, yelled one of the boys from the football team. Gregory was out with the flu, and I had noticed his absence the entire day. As a quarterback and my best friend since third grade, he was the one that stopped most of the bullying that I, I would have normally faced, even when he got made fun of for it. I wished he were here with me in the forest, but I was alone. I couldn't let my wishes distract me. I navigated through the branches, sometimes not fast enough. I knew I would have a bruise on my right shoulder from the few trees I had run into, a bruise to go along with whatever the boys did to me when they caught up. In front of me, the forest seemed to end, opening into a large field of waist-high grass. There would be no more hiding. I knew I would be easy to track that way. They would be able to see me in an open field, but maybe that was a yard. Maybe I could find cover and shelter. I ran as fast as I could. Sports had never been my thing, and the pounding in my chest wouldn't let me forget it. My throat felt dry as a taste similar to blood faintly filled my senses. Then I was out of the woods. Only the trouble was still following. The grass grazed up to my knee as I kept running. I could hear the boys breathing and whooping behind me as their feet pounded on the ground like a stampede of bulls out for blood. The sunlight seemed to burn against my pale skin as I kept running through that field. The only point of reference I had was a large tree trunk that stuck out of the middle of a sea of grass, seeming to have been cut unevenly by lightning. A spire of wood stuck out, stuck up from the trunk as if it were a sword trying to cut open the sky. That's where I trained my vision. I had to get there. It's all that kept me going. Get to the stump, and then find the next goal after that. Once at the charred bark of the trunk, I rested my hand against it and looked up. The spire of wood stretched to double my height, and a part of me wished that I could break it off and use it as a weapon. Maybe the boys would be afraid of me wielding a giant wooden spike. But that was just in my fantasy. Right now, they were spreading towards me, and it wasn't like I was able to keep much distance between them and myself due to my lack of activity, activity and their obsession with sports. I walked around the trunk. Maybe I should give up. I couldn't run through the entire forest, and honestly, I didn't even know when it would stop. I could run through the whole state before exiting the forest for all I knew, and those boys would catch me long before that. As I was about to look up at the group encroaching upon me, I noticed a hole in the stump. I thought it was just a hollow part of the trunk, but as I looked closer, the back wall was covered in shadows and seemed like it wasn't even there. In a split second, I knew it was my only option. They would probably find me and pull me out by my feet, but it was worth a shot. I dropped from my my hands and knees and entered the burnt tree carcass. The wood was hard against my knees, but I quickly noticed that the wood wasn't black on the inside like on the outside. Once I was in the stump, it seemed to open up like a cave. The further back I went, the taller and wider it got. I never found the back of the trunk. The shadows just kept moving farther and farther back. I glanced over my shoulder to see that the light of the opening had become a small dot behind me. Simon? I heard a boy yell. Where'd you go, freak? I don't know a Simon, I whispered with a small smile, not wanting the boys to hear me. I looked away as their voices moved on and probably back into the forest. I knew that the darkness around me should have brought on fear of the unknown, but all I felt was excitement about my escape and discovery of some sort of tree tunnel. It got to where I could stand up and walk easily through the darkness, but a light appeared at the other end, and the cave started to shrink back to its normal size. Bright daylight was all I saw as I crawled out of the hole under the forest floor. As I exited, I listened closely, but I heard no one around me. The boys were gone. I was safe. I wasn't sure if I just hallucinated inside of a tree, but the relief of being alone flooded all my thoughts. I stood up and looked at the tree behind me. It was no longer just a trunk, but the hole was still there. The bark showed a light brown color, far from the black charring of lightning. An unsettling feeling started to overcome me as I took in the surroundings. This forest was much denser than that of higher forest. The trees seemed to go on forever, and when I looked up, I saw that they stretched to the heights of skyscrapers. Suddenly, the excitement I had felt was gone, replaced with the overwhelming sense of how small I truly was. Along with that feeling was something else. 
For the first time in my life, my body felt like it was connected to who I was. It was a strange feeling, but it felt like I was full. It was like the truth I had felt on the inside had suddenly excreted to my entire body. My body just seemed right. A soft thud sounded in front of me and my focus was pulled back to the forest. There was a girl standing there. Her brown eyes stared at me intently as a crossbow stayed steadily aimed at my heart. A pink dress that was stained with various colors of dirt and grass covered up majority of her dark skin. Most of the dress was formed by rips of fabric that spanned from the bottom to the waist, which left the garment looking more like ribbons of fabric that were all glued together. A dark purple wooden staff was strapped to her back and stuck out from behind the tight curls of dark hair that fell to just above her shoulders. One end of the staff was coated in silver metal. Her intent gaze stayed glued to me as I took her in. Fear started to spill into my head as I looked at the loaded crossbow. Why are you here? The girl demanded. She moved closer and I saw the sharp lines of her face. On the bridge of her nose, on her jawline, everything about her face was sharp and beautiful. I moved forward as I spoke. I didn't do anything, I said in a rushed voice. It wasn't long until I found out that was a mistake. That doesn't answer my question, the girl said as her finger pulled the trigger on the crossbow. A sharp pain shot through my hand, lilting my body backward until my head hit against the tree that had brought me here. I would have dropped all the way to the ground if my left hand hadn't suddenly been pinned to the trunk behind it. I glanced up as a scream tore out of my mouth. I'd never been the type of person to risk getting hurt, so this pain felt like I had experienced the worst torments of hell. The blood seeped from the puncture in my hand that the arrow stuck out of. The, the, the liquid dripped and ran down my arm into my blouse. Also, I didn't say you could move, the girl said. As she got closer, I could tell that she was probably in her early 20s, a few years older than me. Another scream of pain exploded from my mouth before she placed her empty hand over it. Her long fingers wrapped around my face and grazed my cheek. She brought her face close to mine as she stared into my eyes. Don't want to attract any unwanted company, she said with a smile. Promise to be quiet? What could be more unwanted than being shot by a random girl in the woods? As my thoughts ran wild, I nodded my head frantically. Good. She removed her hand from my mouth. I thought about screaming anyways, but I figured my chances were better if I remained quiet. She grabbed a strand of my red hair and twirled it in front of my eyes. She looked at my hair closely, and then she looked down at my chest. So, she said quietly with a grin, what's a pretty mortal girl like you doing in my backyard? My thoughts were suddenly in a marathon. How's my short hair in front of my face? Girl, why was she looking at my chest? Mortal, what else was there? What appeared to be my hair still twirled in between her fingers. It was long and red, a strand that I had only been able to have with the wigs in my room. Then I looked down. My chest filled out the blouse in the way that it was meant to. I didn't have a chance to even start to understand what was happening. As if to answer my next question, the girl dropped my hair and pushed hers back behind one of her ears. Instead of a roundness at the top of her ear, there was a, top, a sharp point. I wanted to drop to the ground out of surprise, but my hand was still pinned. Her smile grew as she relished in the shock written on my face. What did you do? I asked forcefully. I normally kept to myself, but something was wrong. I couldn't just stay quiet and hope for things to fix themselves. I shot your hand because you're a trespasser, she said, walking a few steps away. She looked up to the tops of the trees as if something better awaited her there. What did you do to my body? I demanded. To my chest and my hair. She whipped her head around. Her eyes ran up and down my body. You mean you aren't normally this hot? She said. That's a shame. Embarrassment coursed through my body. I wasn't this hot. Because the world wasn't fair. It made me something I wasn't. But now this body had suddenly been gifted to me, and if it wasn't permanent, I would fight for it. The body that finally felt correct. So that's about the first seven pages from the fantasy story entitled The Realm of Truth. And so obviously that story um, has the protagonist as a trans girl um, who's in high school named Avalon. And all of the other stories focus on um, a variety of different identities. So this is transgender, and then there's some others like gay, lesbian, all of that. Um, but even though they are all different identities, the goal within them is just to help people in this community and even outside of this community feel seen and heard and just feel a connection to the stories and just kind of confidence and feel supported by them in the way that I have felt um, by LGBTQ plus literature that I've read in the past. And so that is the main goal of this project and I hope that these stories achieve that.